In this video, I'm gonna be showing you eight things you need to know to solo with the cage system. This is kind of a toolbox of the things that I rely on whenever I'm using the cage system to build solos. I'm gonna show you how to build a one, four, five progression using cage shapes, staying in one position. Then we're gonna look at the major arpeggio for each one of those cage shapes and see how it overlaps those shapes. I'll also be showing you some common scales like the major scale, the major pentatonic scale, the country composite scale, and the blue scale, and see how those scales overlap these cage shapes. We're also gonna be breaking these cage shapes into more manageable groupings of notes like triads, triad inversions, and fifth chords. This is all super useful stuff and will change the way you view each position on the fretboard. Before we get started, you're gonna to wanna to grab the free notation and tab at the link down below so you could follow along with this lesson. Also, if you wanna learn more about soloing with the cage system, go check out my course, Cage Connections, at my teaching website, where I go even more in depth on all this material and cover it in all five positions. <laughs> All right, you may have noticed that whole solo never really left the third position. There's so much music in each position of the guitar neck. You don't need to be all over the guitar neck to play a great solo. And honestly, mastering each position is a great approach for starting to master the entire fretboard. Everything I'm gonna show you in this lesson is in the key of G. It's over a one, four, five progression and it's staying all in the third position of the neck and I'm doing this on purpose because I want you to see how all these shapes connect to each other, and I want you to start to see how the major arpeggios, common scales, triads, triad inversions, all these things overlap these cage shapes. All right, let's get started. Number one, being able to build a one, four, five progression in a position using cage shapes. A big part of mastering the fretboard is being able to see common progressions in every position on the fretboard. And one of the most common progressions is a one, four, five progression. Okay, so let's start with our one chord, which is a G chord. And if we're doing this in third position, we're gonna end up with a E-shaped G chord. Probably the first bar chord you ever learned. Our four chord is a C chord, and the closest one in this position is an A-shaped C chord. Our five chord is a D chord, and the closest one in this position is here, C shape D chord. So that's our one, four, five, one. Being able to see this one, four, five progression in every position on the neck and in every key is crucial. These things give us a template for us to build solos and rhythm guitar parts off of. Number two, being able to see the major arpeggios overlap the cage shapes. The cage system does a great job of showing you where most of the major arpeggio notes are, but not all of them. And it's really important that we can see every available root, third, and fifth for each one of these chords in one position. So let's start with our E-shaped G chord. So on the bottom here, we have the root. Next is a third, and that's actually tucked behind this fifth here. So root, three, five, root, three, five, root. For our four chord, the C chord, I could start with the fifth down here on the bottom. So I have five, root. I have this third hidden here behind the fifth. Root, three, five up on top. For our five chord, the D chord, I can actually start on the low E string on the third, up to the five, root, three, five, root, three, and I could grab a five up on top here. It is really important that you memorize that and that you could visualize those overlapping each one of those shapes. The chord tones are our point of resolve. They are the punctuation at the end of the sentence. Number three, knowing the major scale for the key. 
So we're in the key of G. It's important that we know the G major scale in this position and we can see it weave its way through these cage shapes. The one, four, five chords in this progression are all built from notes in the G major scale. So these things work together. Using the scale is gonna help us get around melodically and it's also gonna help us connect chord tones. I'm gonna to do this up and down and I'm gonna do this saying scale degree numbers. Yes, it's really important that you know the names of the notes, but it's also really important that you know how each one of these notes relates back to the key. So I recommend saying this up and down using the scale degree numbers. Okay, starting on G as my root here. So this is gonna be my root. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, root, and then we have another octave. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, root, and I could even reach up to get another two up here. Now, if I wanna connect chord tones, I could use this major scale to do that. Say I wanna connect a three and a five from the G major chord here. Here's a three, here's a five. I could do that by playing a four in between them. Three, four, five. Say I wanna connect a five and a root. Five, six, seven, root. Now I have a way of connecting chord tones more melodically. Number four, seeing triads, triad inversions, and fifth chords overlapping cage shapes. Now, it's often easier to work with smaller groupings of notes when you're soloing. This helps you, you know, keep from getting option paralysis, but it also helps you voice lead your ideas in a more natural way. I'm gonna break up each one of these cage shapes into sets of three strings. And when I do this, I'm gonna end up with triads, triad inversions, and fifth chords. And all a fifth chord is, is just roots and fifths. Third has been omitted. When you see this in a lower register, you're gonna just recognize it as a power chord. But you can play this in other registers too. So we're not always gonna be able to play our triads in perfect sequence. In order to do that, we would end up getting pulled out of the position into a new position and visualizing new shapes. And that's not the point here. We're trying to stay all in one position at a time. Okay, let's begin to find these notes out of our E shape G chord. So on the bottom here, bottom three strings, I have a fifth chord. I have root, fifth, root, power chord, right? Next set of three strings down, I end up with a second inversion, G major triad. Next set of three strings, I have a root position, G major triad. Top three strings, I have a first inversion, G major triad. On to the four chord. This is my A shape C chord. Now, I wanna be able to play everything I can in this position, so I have these two E strings that are not being played with this cage shape. So I have to remember where my notes are from the major arpeggio. I know I have a fifth down here below, so I'm gonna bring my first finger up to cover that, and I end up with a C fifth chord on the bottom. That's five root five. Coming down. Next set of three strings, I have another fifth chord, but this one is root five root. Next set of three strings down is a second inversion C major triad. Top set of three strings is a root position C major triad. On to the C shape D chord. So again, visualizing that major arpeggio overlapping these shapes because I don't want to leave any string out here. On the bottom, I know I have a fifth. So on the bottom three strings, I could play a second inversion D major triad. Coming down into the shape now, root position D major triad. First inversion D major triad. Second inversion D major triad. And I could throw my pinky down on the fifth and I end up with a fifth chord, a D fifth chord. That's five root five. It's so helpful to be able to visualize all those triads, triad inversions, and fifth chords over each shape. It really does make it way more manageable when you're trying to build solos and rhythm guitar parts. So take your time with it. Make sure you remember the names of each one of those triads, triad inversions, and fifth chords, and make sure you can identify all of the chord tones within each one of those three note groupings. Number five, using major pentatonic scales. So if you're gonna be playing any kind of Americana, country, blues, rockabilly, anything like that, you're probably gonna want the sound of a major pentatonic scale. 
And using the major pentatonic scale could be a little trickier than using a major scale because for each chord, you have to play a corresponding scale. So if I'm soloing over a G chord, I have to use a G major pentatonic. If I'm playing over a C chord, it has to be a C major pentatonic. D chord, D major pentatonic. This is one of those things that can make playing country music pretty challenging, is for every chord, we have to play a different scale. Our other challenge is trying to do this all in one position and seeing these major pentatonics overlap these cage shapes. And in order to do that, you really need to know your major pentatonic scales in every position all over the neck. All stuff that I cover in that Cage Connections course. But I'm gonna show you how to do this all in one position here. So let's start with our G chord. So from G, the corresponding pentatonic scale is gonna be a G major pentatonic. This one's pretty easy because we could start right on a G and start on the root here. So this is a five note scale. So I have, I'm gonna call it out in scale degree numbers for you. It's root, two, three, five, six, and then it begins again. Root, two, three, five, six, root. And I could also grab a two up here. So you can see how this, nicely overlaps that E-shaped chord. For our four chord, the A-shaped C chord, I need to use a C major pentatonic, but it has to be one that's gonna overlap this shape. So I have to pick the major pentatonic that starts on the five of C, the G. So before the G was the root of the one chord, the G chord, over this chord, it's acting as a five. So it's five, six, root, two, three, five, six, root, two, three, five, six. For a five chord, the D chord, the closest D major pentatonic is the one that starts on the third of D, the F sharp. So three, five, six, root, two, three, five, six, root, two, three, five. Each one of those scales overlaps all those shapes really nicely, or each one of those shapes really nicely. That is super foundational if you're gonna be soloing over any kind of country music, you kind of need to be able to see those things. Those become great highways for connecting chord tones. Number six, using the country composite scale. So everything we've done up to this point has been very diatonic. Major scales, major pentatonics. So we're gonna add a little bit more color and we're gonna do this to our major pentatonic scale. We're gonna add a flat three in between the two and the three. That's gonna give us a nice chromatic passing tone. And we're gonna be adding in a flat seven and that's gonna give us more of a dominant sound or more of a mixolydian type sound. By adding in these two notes to a major pentatonic sound, we end up with a scale that a lot of people call the country composite scale. Again, this is a scale that has to correspond with every chord that you're playing over. So if I'm playing over a G chord, I need to use the G country composite scale. If it's over a C chord, C country composite, D, country composite. So let's go through these scales and I'm basically playing the same exact uh, major pentatonics that I played before, but I'm adding in these extra notes here. So starting on the root for the G chord, I have root two flat three on its way to the three. That's that chromatic passing tone. Five, six, half step higher than six gives me my flat seven. That's gonna give me more of that dominant sound or mixolydian type sound. And then it begins again. Root, two, flat three on its way to the three. Five, six, flat seven, root two. And I can get a flat three, I could even kind of stretch up and get a three up there. Okay, over the four chord, the C chord, starting on the five, using the C major pentatonic as kind of my template and just adding in the flat three and the flat seven. So five, six, flat seven, root two, flat three on its way to the three, five, six, flat seven, root two, flat three, three, five, six, flat seven. Five chord, D chord, starting on the third, using the D major pentatonic again, just adding in those passing tones. Three, five, six, flat seven, root, two, flat three, three, five, six, flat seven, root two, flat three, three, five. 
This scale is great and I use it a ton. Whenever I'm playing country music, I'm leaning on that scale pretty heavily. That's what gives me a lot of those great bluegrass kind of chicken picking type runs. <laughs> Number seven, seeing dominant seven shapes. So now that I've added this flat seven in the country composite scale, and we're playing around with that dominant seven sound, which is the same as the flat seven, or this mixolydian sound, major scale with a flat seven, um, I think it's really helpful to be able to see movable dominant seven chords and to see dominant seven chord shapes in one position. And it's pretty easy to convert arcade shapes to movable dominant seven chords. So let's do that. Let's take our E shape G chord, and we're gonna lift up our pinky here, and that's gonna give us access to the flat seven there behind it, the F natural. That's one way to do it. We could do this another way by placing the pinky here on the F natural of the B string, so then we have two, we're just kind of reinforcing that flat seven. And that's a nice movable shape. Many of you already kind of know this shape. Going on to our A shape C chord. Flat seven is gonna be a B flat. I could add it up here on the sixth fret of the E string. That's great whenever we're playing blues or rockabilly or doing any kind of uh, Travis picking type stuff. Love that sound. But we could also take this root here, this C, lift that up and get the flat seven behind it. So we end up with this shape. Whenever you're trying to add in an extension or a flat seven or anything like that, if you have two roots, it's always cool to get rid of one and you're always able to get rid of one of the fifths. And we're gonna do that here for the five chord, the D chord. So here, my only option to kind of throw in this flat seven without losing this low D, which is giving me kind of context for the rest of the chord here, is to put it on the fifth fret of the G string. And that's gonna be in front of the fifth. But that's okay. Like I said, you could always get rid of the fifth. Your ear kind of naturally fills in the fifth once the root is there. So now I have three movable dominant seven shapes. I could see all these in one position. Dominant seven for the one chord, dominant seven for the four, and dominant seven for the five. And this is great because it just gives us yet another visual aid when we're building solos. Number eight using the minor pentatonic and blues scale over a one, four, five progression in a position. All right, everything we've done up to this point has been very major-y sounding. Major pentatonics, major arpeggios, country composite scale, major scale. So we've been really missing kind of a bluesy rock and roll sound, and we're gonna be able to get into that sound by using a minor pentatonic scale and a blues scale. And I'm putting both of these together because they're basically the same scale. The only difference is, is that the blue scale has a chromatic passing tone between the fourth and fifth scale degree. So let's check this out. We're gonna be doing this in G minor. It's gonna be a root position, G minor pentatonic scale. So I'm gonna call it out in scale degree numbers. Root, flat three, four, five, flat seven. Begins again, root, flat three, four, five, flat seven, root. And we can grab a flat three up there. The only difference between this and the blue scale is that chromatic passing tone. So here's the blue scale, root, flat three, four, chromatic passing tone on the way to the five. You could call that a sharp four. You can call it a flat five. Some people call it a blue note. Flat seven, root, flat three, four, little passing tone on the way to the five, flat seven, root, flat three. All those notes can sound great over that one, four, five progression, but that doesn't mean you can play whatever you want, whenever you want. You still have to target chord tones, uh, but you just have to do it with what notes you have available to you from these scales. So you don't always get to play around with every single chord tone. For instance, when I'm playing over a G chord, the only notes in the minor pentatonic or blues scale that I have to target with are a G and a D, the root and the five. So I could land on either one of those notes. And they'll sound good over that chord. If I'm playing over a C chord, the only notes from the blues are minor pentatonic that will line up with the C chord is the C and the G, which is the root and fifth. 
those notes are gonna sound good with the C chord. Over the five chord, the notes from the blues scale and minor pentatonic that work with this chord shape are gonna be the D and the C. And over the D chord, that's a root and flat seven. Those notes are gonna sound good to target when you're playing over that five chord, that D chord. But great sound and gives us a completely different color to play around with when we're soloing. All right, so there's eight things I think every guitarist should know when they're soloing with the cage system. The list doesn't end here. There's a lot of other things you can add, but this is a lot to get you started. And you can see there's so much to learn just in one position. So it really does benefit you by focusing in on one position at a time. And if you do this and you take the time, it will change the way that you look at the fretboard. I do this in all five positions in my Cage Connections course. So if you're interested in that and really kind of mastering this stuff everywhere on the fretboard, I wanna offer that course to you at a discount. Also remember the notation and tab for this lesson are free. So go check out all those links down below. If you wanna support this channel, the best way to do that is to hit the subscribe button. It's a little thing on your end, but it really does help me a ton in growing this channel. I'm also on Instagram if you wanna follow me over there. I'm always posting performance clips and guitar picks and all that good stuff. Let me know if you have any questions down below. I'll do my best to get to as many of them as I can. I hope you guys enjoyed this lesson and thanks for watching.